shot. We're going to stab it. What a pleasure to have as open readers do that from uh, Emory University today. Uh, and he, he is the vice chair of health policy and practice at the Emory University. And also, he had a huge role in the American College of Radiology. He was the immediate past counselor speaker, which is the best job, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> he had instead of a speaker. Anyway, he has done so much work in health policy, even demilitarization. He published extensively, and he has extensive experience, not only American College of Radiology, but now is the leading um, RL, uh, uh, Radiology Leadership Institute which is uh, one of the biggest uh, institute uh, for leadership for radiology training and also uh, the faculty. So uh, we're so pleased to have him a uh, talk this morning for you, raise a lecture, uh, as well as Grand Brown noon. Uh, so with that, uh, I will ask Dr. Jizek to start the medical malpractice, the elephant in the reading room. Thank you, um, Yoshimi. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Wow. I applause this early for me. That's um, great. I'm really honored here. Let me see if the remote works. No. Okay. I'm, I think I'm going to be stuck here at the... Um, yep. Okay. This one works. Good. So I can move around a little bit. Well, thank you all for um, uh, attending this morning. It looks like there's a number of people on Zoom. And I think for camera and microphone purposes, uh, that means I'm uh, locked standing here. I usually like to walk around a little bit, uh, partly because I'm a little ADD, as you'll probably realize as um, I talk through the session. Uh, the, the topic for this morning, as I've um, been back and forth with Yoshimi and um, team about some uh, topics here, um, is something that most residents don't get a whole lot of exposure to uh, the whole issue of medical malpractice. And, you know, I started getting interested in this topic back when I was in private practice. I was in private practice for about 18 years, was president of the group in my home state of Pennsylvania. And um, we'll, we'll talk, I'll editorialize a little bit about the uh, litigation climate in uh, Pennsylvania, as you'll see here, but it is uh, one of the most unfavorable in the nation. So it was pretty common for us, uh, a group of 24 radiologists, to have a couple people sued every year, and I would participate with our insurance carrier from a point of view of the risk management and got to see the cases up front, got to understand the process a little bit, um, and also as well, um, which is one of the, my wrap-up points, get to see a little bit of the impact <clears throat> of being sued on um, morale and um, the, the psyche of the radiologist who've made innocent errors or sometimes not even errors at all. Um, and so with that is a little bit of context. I'm gonna take you through a bit of a whirlwind tour of some issues in medical malpractice. Um, I would like to disclose some um, uh, financial and fiduciary relationships here. Um, even though um, you know all of that, I'm speaking for myself, I will editorialize quite a bit. So um, if you don't like what I say, it's me and not the people who have um, supported me in the process. I will put in a little bit of a plug as somebody who um, pivoted from private practice to academic radiology at age 50. I have really found um, an amazing amount of opportunities within our professional societies and partly um, you know, all the years of charitable giving I've had to these organizations have paid off nicely. I mean, the RSNA supported me with an education scholars grant to really get um, up to speed in that space um, in the health policy education. And um, I was fortunate um, for two years, which just uh, ended this past summer to be the rank and raise uh, Leonard Berlin um, scholar. Um, as part of my deliverables for that, we've had a portfolio of some research in this space. I really won't getting into the weeds uh, with that, um, but did um, prepare for the rank and raise an online course um, in this area. So if you're interested in this stuff, the program is free and I get no royalties. This is not a shameless plug for Rich to get some extra money to buy a new car or anything. Um, this is really just um, you know putting giving back to the Rentkin Ray um, and letting you know about the resources. That program is free for uh, residents. And uh, we'll go into a lot of these topics in a lot more detail um, if you're sort of sick enough in the mind that you actually want to learn more about this stuff here. So what I'd like to do over the next hopefully 45 minutes and then leave some time for question and answer is just hit some very high level concepts of risk management. You know, how do you, should you be thinking now at this point in your career and later on when you're a leader in your own practice, whether it's a private or an academic practice, about mitigating risk for your practice? One of the pieces I like to say to people that have been involved in lawsuits and say, oh, we went to court and we won, is you never win. Once your name is on a lawsuit, you've already lost 
ton with regard to time, with stress and all those types of things. So, you know, the best lawsuit is one that you can prevent. Um, I will spend some time talking about um, facts and figures. There is an awful lot of misinformation in this space. A lot of anecdotes out there. Did you know so and so got sued because of this and that? And you begin to believe that these sort of whisper down the lane types of stories become truth. Um, there, there is a body of literature, although it's um, a little bit hard to find. And again, some thanks to the Rankin Ray Society for getting me the protected time to get into this space. I'll review some of that, particularly with the focus of radiology. I'll spend some time talking about the concept of an expert witness, something that trainees probably don't think about a lot um, because. He, you, you haven't been exposed to this process, um, but ultimately an expert witness will either make or break your case. Um, and that being said, a lot of radiologists in their careers participate as experts themselves. And so you really want to know a little bit about the um, a lay of the land there. I will talk about one area of um, reasons that radiologists get sued, the so-called NIS, which is the most common reason radiologists get sued. I will highlight for you a number of the other big buckets of um, reasons that radiologists get sued and refer you if you're interested in learning more about those, particularly if you're an interventional radiologist, there's a whole separate module in the Rentgen Ray course, and then spend a few minutes talking about the intersection between this and physician wellness, something that I think does not get enough attention. Our risk managers, our lawyers always think about sort of the dollars of this, but they don't think about the human cost to our doctors, our nurses of being involved in this type of litigation. So we'll spend some time talking about the concept of the second victim syndrome in these situations. No, it did work. Okay, I'm back to the keyboard here. Ooh, or I'm frozen. Okay, it is slowly working. So a little bit about the um, title here. I do have in the fine print here, if you've not heard the term, the title, the um, elephant in the room. Um, has anybody ever heard that term, the elephant in the room? Okay, so a number of people, you know, it's one of these concepts, I think it comes back from some old British folklore. And if you think about sort of Thanksgiving, you know, you go to Thanksgiving and there's your old troublesome, you know, Uncle Charlie who drinks too much and he knocks over the furniture and stuff, but nobody wants to upset the family event by, you know, confronting or talking talking about Uncle Charlie, and you just sort of suck it up and deal with it. In a lot of ways, um, medical malpractice is the elephant in the living room. You know, we know it's out there, um, it, you know, it, there, but really people don't want to talk about it, particularly if they've been named as a lawsuit. So some comments about risk management here. Why do lawsuits occur? I think if you ask a lot of doctors, it's, well, they occur because you've got those darn trial lawyers. They're you know, money-grubbing people, ambulance chasers that are out there. But the reality is, um, while they are obviously the enablers of this process, um, they are not the root cause of this. You know, The root cause really is that people have been harmed, they're angry, um, and we've got a court system that allows, a tort system that allows people to get financial um, recourse for injury um, if they are um, negligent there. And so you invariably see one thing, and this is what everybody focuses about in a medical malpractice lawsuit is, well, you sued somebody because you had an adverse outcome. You had something that didn't work well, right? As a general rule, if you went and you had an operation and everything worked well, you're not going to sue your doc. And that's what everybody thinks about. But I think the other important piece here in the intersection of the Venn diagrams is that you've got an unhappy patient um, there. Somebody who wasn't communicated with, or they were treated treat it with disrespect and they're angry. And so sometimes for them, this is sort of their chance to get vengeance, their chance to get justice, much more than their chance to get money. Um, and it really is the intersection between those two. If you have served as an expert witness, and you read the depositions, it's the bad outcome, but they're unhappy with the process for some reason. I like to tell the story, I won't mention his name, but when I was in private practice in uh, Memphis, I served as medical director of a, um, a federally designated um, uh, a critical access hospital in Northern Mississippi. Um, and you know the quality of care there was quite variable. There was one of the general surgeons there who was the nicest guy. I mean, I love to have lunch with this guy, but as an interventional radiologist, he was really good for business. Um, you know, I mean, I 
drained a lot of abscesses um, and embolized a lot of bleeds that postoperatively that probably should not have happened. Um, and his patients loved him, even though his complication rate, everybody knew about it out there. Um, and, you know, remember, you know, Northern Mississippi, you're in the Bible Belt. And so he had most of his patients, you know, when they had something bad, they'd sit there, they'd hold hands, they'd pray. And, you know, God, why did you do this to me? And it's like, no, he did it to me. Um, but he really had his patients loving him and almost never got sued here. So uh, I'm not suggesting that's the solution here. It's better to have the good outcomes. Um, but it is the patient experience that matters in these cases here. So the way to mitigate your risk then is basically to make those two circles smaller and then the Venn diagram overlap decreases, you know, do the best you can to have the best outcomes and do your best to manage expectations. I think one important thing for us as radiologists is that, you know, you're at the work list, you're not there talking to the patient, but I think we all have opportunities as leaders in our practice to think about the patient experience in a longitudinal way. If the people at scheduling were rude to them, if the people at checkout were obnoxious to them or it's at registration or the technologists were not sensitive to individual issues for them, they're already coming into the, the encounter angry, and guess who they're going to take it out on if the interpretation is less than satisfactory. And so I think if you can think from a systematic approach in your practice, in your own personal practice, but also in whatever group you wind up joining to the trainees, um, about making both of those circles as small as possible, then your risk of getting sued is then as small as possible. Um, and so anyway, that's a little bit of context. I'll come back to that at the end. I, I would like to provide also some overarching context for sort of why is it, and I'm not sure what the Salt Lake market is. I got back too late from dinner last night on my East Coast body time to look at the news and to see, um, you know, if you've got the bottom feeders that are um, taking, um, you know, run all the commercials as they are in the Atlanta area, you know, have you been a victim of malpractice? Call 1-800-MAKE-BUCKS or something like that um, that's out there. But, you know, a lot of the conversation really changed over the course of my career. This report from the Institute of Medicine about 19 90 came out to err is human. And if you read some of the quotes in the front of this book, and it's some very you know, esteemed authors of this, it really has set the stage for the quotes that people still use to say, you know, hospitals are terrible places. At least 44,000 people and perhaps as many as 98,000 people die in hospitals each year as a result of medical errors that could have been prevented. You know, and that exceeds the amount of deaths attributed to motor vehicle wrecks, breast cancer, and AIDS. Sort of like, you know, medical malpractice is everywhere. Sensationalism is all over there. This is the headline from something in NPR, you know, more patients die from medical errors every day than, you know, it's the equivalent of three jumbo jets crashing. Well, you know, there's also context in these situations. Not everybody who dies in the hospital is a result of a medical error. Sometimes they're just really sick. And just like, you know, my Delta flight back home this afternoon, you know, probably if somebody is being wheeled down the jet bridge in cardiogenic shock, the pilot's probably going to say, we're not going to let you in our doors. But under Intella, we can't do that in our hospitals. And so we have to take whoever comes into the, through the doors with whatever they present with. The overall context of what this means for all the physicians in the audience, I see some faculty, a lot of trainees as well, is that you have a target on your back and you will have a target on your back until the day you retire. I mean, that's just the nature of being a physician that's out there. So let me get you some statistics of what this means here. Um, this is some work from um, Bapu Jena, who's a um, uh, health services researcher. He's, one of my, he's actually my favorite health services researcher. He's um, an MD hospitalist in, um, in the Boston system, but also as a PhD in economics from um, uh, the University of Chicago, very uh, prestigious economics program. And he does some, just some fascinating, fascinating stuff. Medical malpractice is um, one of the areas of interest for him and South Seabury um, and their team as well. This is an article published in the New England Journal about a decade ago. Um, looking at the proportion of physicians facing a medical malpractice claim annually um, by their specialty. And if you look in the center here um, of this here, all physicians I've circled at the top of that um, red box here, about 7% of all physicians in the United States will get sued each year on average there. Um, radiologists are two, just two notches down below that, anesthesiologists and radiologists. So about 7% of all radiologists across the country will get sued every year. Um, that's the blue. If you look in the orange here, the legends covered up with the Zoom stuff, that corresponds to the amount of indemnity payouts. So basically about two to 3% will 
actually pay out. And that goes with the overall statistics. If you as a physician get named in a lawsuit, there's probably a tw only a 25% chance that actually leads to money in there. It gets dropped, it gets dismissed. The majority of these cases go nowhere over time. But that's a single year. And I think to look at this sort of from a point of view of cumulative probability, um, and I'm going to depress all the, the youngest of the physicians in the audience here, <clears throat> is that if you look at his graphs for high risk versus low risk specialties and radiology is about in the middle, I went back into the appendices for the online article. Um, so it couldn't construct the, um, uh, the curves, but highlighted in um, blue and uh, red here, some statistics. So radiologists, by the time the average radiologist is age 45, there's a 57% chance that person will be named in a lawsuit at least once. OK, that's not far away for a lot of you folks. Time flies as you get older, as those of us with some gray hair know. 90% um, chance that, you know, you guys will have been sued at least once by the time you retire. Sobering statistics. Payout, 17% have actually settled a case or paid out a case by the time they're 45, 53%. So slightly greater than even odds will have paid out in a medical malpractice lawsuit by the time they retire. Now that doesn't mean you made an egregious error. Some of these wind up being, you know, $25,000 payouts to just, you know, nuisance suit, make it go away in these situations. But that does show up on your hospital credentialing and the like. And it's there every two years to remind you like, oh my God, remember that case 30 years ago about this. And, you know, it just, it leaves people there. Um, it's also important to think, and this is some work uh, led by um, Seth Seabury, who's on Bapu's team um, in health affairs, very prestigious health policy journal that's out there. They took an interesting look at this of how long do these things last, you know, thinking about the, the cost emotionally on your practice of this. And you look at a medical malpractice lawsuit for physicians overall, the mean time from a point of view of you've been served until there's adjudication, which may be a dismissal, it may be a court um, decision, is 20 months. And radiology, again, there is just about average, 19 months as well. It's fascinating. If you look at the top part of this, younger physicians have shorter windows until closure of cases than old physicians. You can't say for sure with the data, but having participated in a lot of risk management um, activities in, in private practice and working with our healthcare insurer, my experience has been this, is younger physicians tend to say, you know, if we can settle out of this for $25,000, just make it go away. And once you get to be old and cantankerous like me, you're like, I'm going to take the SOBs to court, we're going to fight it and just go on as well. Um, and so there, there's a lot of emotional um, attachment to this stuff as well. They did something really fascinating just from a point of view, again, thinking about the human capital impact of this. They took that time and then they looked at the average time that physicians in various specialties spend in their careers. And if you look, radiologists, again, slightly less than average. I mean, this is one area, you know, we all as physicians, right, we want to be at the top of the curve. All the medical malpractice statistics, you do not want to be at the top. This is not Lake Wobegon here. You want to be down towards the bottom, <clears throat> excuse me, with the psychiatrists and the pediatricians. But average, now there's some physicians who spend more time, some who have zero time, but the average radiologist across the country spends 10% of his or her days in practice with an active lawsuit over their head there. So, you know, one in 10 days, waking up in the morning, say, oh, is today the day that my lawyer is going to say, you know, they're going to haul me in for the deposition or something like that. Um, so again, emotional toll of this, but also the financial cost is very real. Is it getting better over time? I mean, people have been complaining about this ever since I was a medical student back in the late 80s. And the answer is, it depends. You know, if you look at this work from Schaefer and Jam Internal Medicine published about five years ago, and again, the numbers aren't as important as the points here um, with this, but if you look at this from 1992 to 2014, the statistics are always lagging. 38% reduction in the annual rates of paid claims, suggesting, hey, it's getting a lot better, a lot less payouts. <clears throat> That's the good news. Bad news with this, if you look at this, 36% increase in the amount of consumer price um, adjusted dollars that are paid out. So as a general rule, the, tri the trial lawyers are getting savvier. They're picking the highest dollar cases, they're throwing all those resources at them, and they're going less and less after the frivolous lawsuits because they're working on a contingency basis. And for them to sort of pepper the field with frivolous lawsuits is not a good use of their resources, paying experts and the like. So frequency going down, dollar amounts going up, total dollars going back and forth is just about the same over time. 
Location matters a lot. I alluded to this. This is some work, um, and I'll talk about our published paper in JACR a little bit um, from our preliminary data, getting National Practitioner Data Bank um, data overall looking per state at counts of lawsuits paid out per 100,000 population in the state. If you look back where I started my private practice in Pennsylvania, um, Philadelphia is the lawsuit um, uh, cesspool of the world. Uh, back when I was working with, uh, you know, volunteering with the Pennsylvania Medical Society, um, the statistics when we went to lo uh, lobby on our Capitol Hill every day was there were more dollars paid out in medical malpractice lawsuits in the city of Philadelphia every year than the entire state of California. Um, really bad here. You guys are in a pretty good place. I'm in a pretty good place. We're green. Um, you know, we're not as good as some states um, that are more rural here. Um, if you flip that another way, that is the frequency of these. If you look at the dollar amounts, you get some interesting pieces there of like Texas gets more green because they've got some really good sort of caps on damages. You guys stay pretty green. Um, we go yellow in our state. Pennsylvania, New York um, remain pathetically um, red. Um, so um, if you have any interest in going back um, to my old practice, it's a great group, um, but um, this is what you have to deal with uh, living in that state. So for trainees, this is some, <clears throat> some work we published in JCR within the last year led by um, Ken Tharp, who's one of our um, former students. Um, we dug into um, into legal databases. Um, and now admittedly, this is, we found 580 training involved cases um, in, in medical malpractice lawsuits between 2009, 2018. This is not a national overall, all cases. This is a sample of those. So the statistics are really important here. Only 4% of those involve radiology. So radiology trainees don't get named, um, aren't involved in these lawsuits that much. And when you are involved in a lawsuit, um, it's less than half the time they actually name you individually. They go after the attending all of the time in these cases. Um, you know, and, and you know, pieces here, I'm not going to tell you what to do if you get named in one of these, but there's always the plausibility. It's like, I don't know, I gave the right answer and Dr. Brown changed my report after I signed it in PowerScribe, you know? So throw Rich under the bus here. Um, but I, I think realistically, they can go back and track that there. A lot of this is much more Sutton's law. If you've ever heard about Willie Sutton, the famous bank robber, when he finally got caught, you know, why do you rob banks? Well, duh, that's where the money is. Um, you're gonna go after me rather than you because I've got a lot more net worth. Um, and the other piece as well is vicarious liability, the concept that you're working for me as a trainee and you know the captain of the ship is the person you name. Um, trainee hotspots, um, now this is just counts of cases here. Um, again, ooh, gee, look at my old home state, keeps popping up all the time here. Now some of the states show up a lot because they're just big populations um, and I have a lot of training programs that are out there. Um, again, you guys are hiding in the tall grass as we are, which is a good place to be here. Um, if you look at radiology versus non-radiology trainee risk. Um, again, you're about average. Incidence rate ratio compared with all specialties of trainees. Look at confidence intervals between 0.52 and 1.2. So you're, you're within the margins of just being average in there. Our colleagues that are much more likely, whether they're trainees or in practice, Private, or practice later to get sued or emergency medicine, OB-GYN and surgery. Um, and I think this probably drives, particularly in the emergency department setting, part of the reason that they're being self-protective of just ordering imaging. They have very little relationship with patients and you know, we're just trying to make the best decisions they can here. Why do trainees get sued? Pretty much the same reason that attendings get sued. The majority of these are so-called misses. We'll break that graph down a little bit some more later. So with that as a little bit of context, let me pivot into you know, what I've already alluded to is defensive medicine protective. If you listen to trial lawyers, they'll say, oh no, defensive medicine, you know, we don't drive defensive medicine at all. Um, and, and the truth is just, it's not the case. I mean, we all know it anecdotally, some work by um, Bapu Jenna, uh, again, same team doing some really great work at an all payer claims database out of Florida published in the British Medical Journal, um, where they basically looked at various specialties. General surgery was the highest. And so what they looked at here was, does a physician spending on care, including imaging, including laboratory testing, is that associated with a decrease in their medical malpractice risk? And the answer is yes. Now, it's not that huge. It's anywhere from a, you know, an absolute 1% to 3% change, but there is real benefit of ordering more imaging and protecting yourself that's out there. And so what we may say, that's an unnecessary test from a broad policy perspective, that general surgeon or that emergency physician is basically thinking, no, I'm looking after me first, my patient second there as well. 
This is some work that I alluded to. We published in JCR um, because uh, very recently within the last year with again, almost all of these cases being litigated at the state level in state courts, looking at imaging utilization and looking at paid malpractice claims with the belief being this is, does a physician's awareness of a lawsuit today impact his or her imaging ordering behavior after the fact. So, you know, if you're an emergency physician, you know, John got sued last year for this, Susan got sued last month for this, crap, I'm just gonna order more imaging. Um, and we believe our hypothesis held true. Admittedly, it's inelastic um, in the relationship, but if you look at year one, each 1% increase across states and over time, in paid medical malpractice claims is associated with next year, a 0.2% increase in the utilization of imaging. So it's not one-to-one -one here, but it is a driver and an influencer as other, a lot of other folks um, uh, have, have shown. So we believe at least, obviously we, we didn't prove it, but it's an, a tight association. So let me pivot from that for criteria for medical malpractice claim. And a lot of you have heard this in risk management courses in a variety of areas. There's four things that um, in the ideal world need to be proven to make a meritorious claim. There needs to be duty, which exists when you're taking care of a patient. So, you know, Thursday I'll be on clinical service and, you know, I do a renal biopsy, say, and I get a call from the ambulatory area half hour later and says, you know, Dr. Juzak, you know, your patient's blood pressure is 80 and his heart rate's 140. And I'm like, I'm really hungry. I'm over at lunch. Give me 20 minutes. Um, I've got a duty to respond to that patient now right away. Contrast that with at least from a legal duty. I'm on, you know, Delta flight 400 flying back to Atlanta tonight. You know, when you get there, the, is there a doctor on board dreaded call um, there um, in that situation? Do I have a legal duty to go back? No. Do I think I have an ethical duty? Yes. Um, I just share my advice. Welcome, you know, um, the, for the faculty and the audience, you've all been on planes and have heard this as well. I subscribe to the rule of 10, you know, is there a doctor on board? Uh, one, two, three, four. And if I get to 10 and an internist or an emergency physician or cardiologist hasn't responded, then I will go back there because figuring there's nothing in 10 seconds um, that I'm going to be able to make um, or break. Um, so um, anyway, duty, um, you're here in the hospital. You've got to have the duty there. Um, breach. This is important. You've breached um, that, that standard of care. And we'll spend some time talking about what the standard of care is, because that's really where cases are made uh, or broken here. Causation. The breach was the proximate cause of, of injury. So, you know, you read a chest CT and there's like a lung tumor is like this big, you know, big as your head there. And you just don't even comment on it. But that night, that patient comes into your emergency department with a ruptured subarachnoid, uh, with a ruptured berry aneurysm and dies of a subarachnoid hemorrhage. There's not causation. Did you breach the standard of care? Yeah, but you didn't kill that patient in that situation. And then there's damages, which vary a lot by state, depending upon emotional pain and suffering and those types of things. Standard of care is important to understand um, in this situation. This does not mean you need to be the world famous, you know, expert, a board examiner type of person in this space. Depending upon your state, you just need to practice as an ordinary, reasonable, or prudent physician, which has been defined in the courts as the course of action which a reasonably prudent physician in the defendant's specialty would have taken under the same or similar circumstances. Um, but you have to convince that to a jury because the jury decides what's the standard of care. And how do they do it with dueling experts um, in these situations? Basically that, you know, you have to get a group of 12 people to say, well, you know, this is the appropriate way to do nuclear medicine in this situation as well. And the problem with the court system is that our juries are highly, highly unpredictable. Um, this is a pretty famous case. I went to medical school, Penn State Hershey. So I was a couple hours away from Temple University Hospital when this all played out. And this got a lot of attention for us. There was a woman um, who underwent a brain CT examination at Temple University Hospital back in the early to mid 80s. Um, and the jury ultimately rendered an about a million dollar verdict against the faculty radiologist in Temple University Hospital. Now, what was that for? It was not because of an egregious error like this, this you know, huge missed subarachnoid hemorrhage. I'll give you the headline from the Los Angeles Times. She said her powers vanished because she's a psychic and that radiation killed her livelihood. Now, ultimately, this was overturned by the state Supreme Court in this situation. But my point here is you take any case to court, even something as BS as this, 
The jury can do whatever the jury decides to do in those situations. And hence, part of the reason where people say, you know what, I can settle out for 25 grand. It's coming out of my insurance. Yeah, I take the hit on my credentialing, but I just don't want to be in the newspaper for a million dollar setup here. So again, um, dueling experts are the piece here, which is really fascinating. This is a real quote from an article Lenny Berlin wrote on the topic that a, a expert witness really said, any miss is always malpractice. I mean, you can find some Somebody who will be paid to say anything in these situations. And what the juries don't notice is basically each side gets one expert there, is that for the defense case, they called 10 people, they all reviewed it, and they said, yes, this is absolutely an okay read on this. Plaintiff had to call 100 people to find some bottom feeder to basically say yes, but the jury doesn't realize that. They don't get the sample of this coming in. So one thing to be aware of if you get into these cases, whether you're a defendant or you get uh, or serve as an expert, the ACR has practice parameters on physician witness um, standards that are out there. And increasingly smart defense lawyers are getting aware of this. So they will ask questions, you know, oh, Dr. Brown, you're a world famous nuclear radiologist, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yes, I've been a board examiner. I've been all this. You're a member of the American College of Radiology you, aren't you? Yes, yes. Oh, in fact, you're a fellow of the American College of Radiology. Yes, yes. So you, you think the, the standards of the American College of Radiology are good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why didn't you follow them, dumbass, um, in that situation? And so this is sort of, you know, where they set people up for the trap in these situations. The ACR has basically said, and this is really good advice, if you're being asked to review a case, or if you're a defendant in these cases, you want to work with your lawyer, to make sure that you're setting up that expert to hold being held to the standard. So you should only be reviewing the images at the time that was available to the radiologist when he or she was reading them in the emergency department, not being biased with, okay, we're gonna show you the autopsy report first, and then we're gonna show you the images. Well, you already know where that case um, went. And again, you can see the buzzwords um, that are here. Um, so one piece that's worth understanding in the MedMal domain, having done a lot of expert witness work, I've actually not not done a whole lot on the medical malpractice side. I've done a ton in the fraud and abuse side where you're, you're not going after doctors, which I just find unsavory. You're going after, you know, crook business people um, in, in that situation, which I, I can sleep better at night with. Um, but the same thing here is in the courts is that, you know, we are trained in the scientific method where we're focusing on what's right, regardless of necessarily what our agenda is, although that's sometimes hard. Um, attorneys work in these adversarial systems, and so they're not necessarily looking for the smartest or most competent person. They're looking for the person, you know, who can do the best communication with the jury, those 12 people who really don't know anything about what the medicine is and can sway them in a story. Um, there are some data out there, and we're working on a similar project in the radiology space as well in a number of specialties, um, uh, ENT, neurosurgery, orthopedics, um, uh, anesthesia, where people have looked at the qualifications of people who serve overall, and I don't want to disparage everybody on both sides, for plaintiffs versus defense, and overall defense experts are more qualified when you look at them across a variety of characteristics. Are they fellowship trained? You know, are they in academic practices? Have they done more lectures? Have they done more publications, if they had more years and experience. Fascinatingly, we're, we're preparing a manuscript we'll probably be sending by the end of um, this month. Radiology is about equal in those situations. And I'm not quite sure. I'm still trying to come up with a explanation for that as well. But in a lot of areas, um, the defense experts tend to be more qualified, but the jury doesn't necessarily appreciate that as well. Um, and so it makes it really tough to defend these cases. So where should you think about watching out for? Um, in the time we have left here, I don't want to, I won't be able to get into all of this stuff, but if you look at, um, so I'm just going to pick one area, the so-called miss. This is um, uh, from an article in 2013 by Wang in Radiology, where they looked at a national radiology credentialing um, company, 8,400 radiologists. You can't see it with the Zoom box, but um, the number of allegations was between 4,000 and 5,000. So already, Half of all those docs had been sued um, in this situation. Again, reminding you, this stuff is pretty common. And then they looked at the breakdown of what those lawsuits were based upon the records available from the attorneys there. 24% of them, you couldn't figure it out. And this is one of the things that I've learned trying to do some research in this space is that court documents are written by judges and lawyers for judges and lawyers that you're reading this, you're like, I have no idea what this doctor did in this case. Um, and 
that would suggest neither did they, but they, they defended and they um, you know, opined on this. So a lot of them, you can't figure out what they did. Um, almost, you know, over, uh, well, almost two thirds or way more than two thirds, if you exclude the 24%, were related to so-called failure to diagnose, a small number of failure to communicate. That's an increasing area of you know, just dropping the ball with the solitary pulmonary nodule or the like, IR complications and um, informed consent. Um, but what I'm gonna focus on here um, are the perception and interpretation. And again, um, no monetary value for me. You can see here in training price free for the Rankin Ray. If you want to learn about some of these things, particularly if you're in IR, DR, and you want to think about risk management there, there's a short module for about 30 minutes for free in that situation as well. So in the so-called miss, um, some work from Ben Harvey at Mass General, um, looking at about 500 or so court cases within their system of radiology misses. And if you break it up in the pie chart here, about 44% of those were so-called missed cancers, about 16% missed fractures. And the other 40% was a smattering of everything from vasculitis to ruptured aneurysm, to infection, to you know, pyonephrosis. To everything else. So missed cancer is the big one that's out there. You don't want to be missing cancers if at all you can prevent it. <clears throat> what are the cancers most likely missed? Well, breast cancer is about 50% of those. Lung cancer is about a quarter of those as well. Part of the reason that, you know, I think aside from good clinical care, a lot of practices have gone into super subspecialized breast imagers in their practice. So you really have the best people that can withstand the scrutiny of, you know, okay, so Dr. Duzak, you know, the, um, you know, MQSA requires you to read at least 500 mammograms a year to stay certified. Yes, sir, I understand that. How many did you read last year? 501. Um, you know, that, that's, that's going to be laughable in the eyes of a jury when somebody can come back and say, yes, 15,000 um, as the answer there. Um, misses are actually pretty common. There's actually a number of studies that are out there that were never designed to be in the med mal domain. I'll pick on two of them. Um, in the time I have with you here. This is actually written by medical physicists back in 1976 when they were looking at sort of the quality of contact this is back in the old analog days of film, of copying and archiving into smaller images and having radiologist A read the original, radiologist B read the duplicate and say, you know, are these good enough there? Um, what they found in the way, even though way they went back and reconciled with them reading the same thing is discrepancies between radiologists varied from 16% to 38%, depending upon the body part as well. And you've all seen that, you know, five people can look at something and say, it's normal, somebody else picks it up. Does that mean it's malpractice. No, it's just we all have different sets of eyes and different circumstances as well. Uh, Lenny Berlin, again, has written a lot about this. If you're interested in the topic, um, his um, AJR series has been um, put together in a book, and it's just some fascinating sort of short stories that are case-based. Um, he's been writing for a long time about defending the so-called myths. And the challenge that we have in radiology is, is unlike the cardiology pace, case where, you know, was there a heart murmur? Nope you know, well, it wasn't there. The expert can't say, yes, I listened to that patient's heart five years ago. The images are there and you own these things there. Um, and so it sets us up for defending these cases to make it really tough in a topic called hindsight bias, which is the tendency of people knowing what happened to believe that a priori, they could have predicted that. And this is why radiology so-called misses are just so darn hard to defend here. Um, so let me give you an example here. <clears throat> Where's Waldo? Can anybody see Waldo? It's all... It's interesting, like a couple of people will raise their hand there. I, gave, I did this at actually, so we're, we're a few of the, the faculty I dinner with last night. University of Michigan. Yeah, okay, all right, so he's, he's good. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah I got, and I got the 20 bucks from Brown to prove it. Um, yeah, um, but I, I gave this to the residents at University of Michigan and like, this is right before the pandemic. It was like two thirds of hands went up. I'm like, you know what, they're either really good eyes or there's a lot of, yeah, it's, it's there, you know, from the back of the room. I don't know, I, I, I'm not very good at picking these things up. But for those of you who haven't seen Waldo, I've now circled Waldo, everybody can see Waldo, right? So let me take the circle away. Who can see Waldo? Yeah, except for the three people who are asleep, right? Um, so I've showed you Waldo. I've just demonstrated for you hindsight bias. So here's an example of that. This is a case where a friend of mine was involved as the expert witness. So this coronal image from the chest CT is projected on the jumbotron in the opening arguments of, you know, Dr. So-and-so missed this obvious, and this is when it went on and became a pancoast tumor, blah, blah, blah. Now, was this why the radiologist got sued? No. 
Then they show you, well, here's the chest x-ray from six months prior where you get this vague density, anterior first rib, posterior third rib, you know, clavicle. And you're saying, but by the grace of God, you know, I'm not Bill Offerman, but, you know, I'd like to think on a good day, I'd pick this up. But, you know, on a bad day, I think a lot of us could blow by this. Well, where does the jury's eye go immediately after seeing this? Boom, Waldo, ding, 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 radiologist guilty in this situation here. So again, these are really, really hard to defend here. If you do get involved in one of these cases or serve as an expert, this is a great, great paper, which was never designed for this, the Cooperative Early Lung Cancer Group. So this was published back in the early 1980s, when people were actually trying to think about chest x-ray as a way of screening for lung cancer really early. Um, oh, I didn't have my highlights here. So over 4,000 patients, high-risk patients, they underwent chest radiography four to six month intervals. Importantly, these weren't interpreted as rule out disease, you know, generic crappy history from the emergency department. These were interpreted by academic thoracic radiologists in the Mayo system as lung cancer screening studies. Find anything that remotely possibly looks like lung cancer and put your circle on it with your red crayon. They found 92 lung cancers, but then what they did in those situations, which I thought was fascinating is they went back and looked at the prior images and they said that chest x-ray from four months ago can we see it now that we found waldo and guess what depending upon the location you could find it in a super majority of the time does that mean that prior radiologist committed malpractice no what it means is that there's a certain threshold of detectability for these types of abnormalities but if this is sort of the standard there um you know, you, you, you're hosed if you read that prior one when this was really small. Um, and so thoughtful experts defending things, and I've, de I've tried um, to defend a chest x-ray with the so-called missed nodule using this, made a great point. The jury was all nodding their head and, you know, they, they found the radiologist negligent in this situation. Um, but, um, you know, you could only do the best that you can in these situations. The other thing to think about is the concept of satisfaction of search. It's the detection of one abnormality and fears with that of others. <clears throat> Again, I've already told you I'm pretty ADD. You can tell I talk fast. My mom used to try to give me these highlights magazines. Did you guys have highlights magazines as a kid? Okay. I just always have to wonder generationally if that's still something there. And, you know, can you find the 17 differences? I'd find three. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to run off and play in the yard kind of thing. Like, I, I don't have that attention span for doing this stuff. Carol Ashman at Ohio State University published this about 20 years ago. 15 cases with one abnormality, skeletal radiography, 15 cases with two or more abnormalities. And if there was one abnormality, to um, the, the radiologist and actual orthopedic surgeons were also in this could find it 75% of the time. So missing it again, 25%. But when you have multiple abnormalities, they found one of the abnormalities 78% of the time, second and third, about 40% of the time. And the concept here is, you know, it's not, life's not a multiple choice test. Sometimes the answer is A or B or C or D. Sometimes it's A and C, A and D here. Um, and this is really hard, particularly in this sort of hyper volume world that, you know, your work list is blowing up on a Saturday and it's easy for me to say hard to do to slow down, you know, oh, I found the diverticular abscess, just dictate it out, call the report, poof, done. Oops, you know what, miss the, you know, renal cell carcinoma or the pancreatic lesion or whatever in those situations. Um, and we do know there are data out there, no surprise, we all know this anecdotally, is if you force people to work at a faster pace, they miss more. So this is an article in JCR from a few years ago where they clocked people and they said, okay, you have to read X studies in this time as part of this test. If they read at their normal speed, they still had 10% major misses on abdominal and pelvic CT imaging. If you sped up their time, I forget exactly the time, actually they reduced it in half here, they, their miss rate went up two and a half times there as well. Again, Lenny Berlin, very prescient in this space, you know, wrote about this some 20 some years ago, the liability of interpreting too many radiographs. And that was a hard case to make for trial lawyers way back when. Now in a data-driven digital era, this is actually easy because everything you do in your PACs, in your RIS is date stamped, time stamped. I mean, somebody can do it. It's not easy. Say how long you had this image open, how long you had power scribe or whatever dictation system you had invoked in that situation. And then say, you know, look, you only spent this much time. Um, this is a case that got a lot of attention. Um, this is a, an article from Radiology Business Journal um, back earlier, actually last year, $2 million settlement after subpoena of radiologist keystrokes finds lacks 
um, CT reading. And basically, this was what it sounds like from the when I read it. It's probably a missed um, isodense subdural hematoma, um, and the radiologist, you know, so-called missed the finding, and the patient went on, but he, uh, to have a bad outcome. This is what the trial lawyer said: If we were to assume that he, the radiologist, did nothing but open the images up and immediately start reading them, he spent half a second looking at each image. That's two images per second, and that is insanity. Interestingly, if you look at the records that are out there, this radiologist had the head CT study open in packs for six minutes. Now, I won't challenge you to say how many cases you actually have head CTs out of the ER have opened for six minutes, um, but these numbers could have been quite worse. And so, you know, those of us who are sort of talking about this type of stuff are really thinking about, you know, training the next generation of experts in this space to say, well, we don't look at individual images in multi-volume studies where we've got multi-planar 2000 images, this is look, look, looking at a movie. We're scrolling through these. You know, Fantasia, the, you know, the first um, big um, cartoon was filmed at um, 24 frames per second. And you don't watch Fantasia, Mickey here, Mickey here, Mickey here, Mickey here. You look at it in total, and that's how we look at these. So we're really going to need to think about how to defend this stuff when the timestamps are out there working against us. I'm going to wrap up in my last couple of minutes with the concept of physician wellness that I've already alluded to. Um, quote um, Albert Wu from um, Johns Hopkins. Um, who's written, um, this is some 20 years ago, about the concept of second victims. And I think this is a real compelling story when you talk to physicians who have been involved in medical malpractice litigation. Um, and I found that as I've sort of done more and more lecture, I have people approach me afterwards and share their stories. And, you know, it really has some pretty significant impact on them. Although patients are the first and obvious victims of medical mistakes, doctors are wounded by the same errors. They're the sec second victims. You know, none of us intends to harm patients, but the reality is we're all human. We all work long careers looking at lots and lots of imaging studies, and most people will make mistakes. And you just hope by the grace of God that those, those mistakes don't harm patients, but sometimes they do. Um, there is now, the Zoom is covering it up. I've got a lot of references down in the bottom in the fine print and be glad to share those. But there's a growing body of literature that indicates that medical malpractice litigation contributes to physician self-doubt burnout and depression. We already know the rates of suicide among physicians is very high. People have cited as much as a class, um, you know, an average medical school class each year of physicians kills themselves. Now, is medical malpractice driving that? No, but there are some anecdotes of that being the tipping point for some people here as well. So I think as we're thinking about wellness more broadly, this is a topic that needs to be into consideration. One of the pieces there is, you know, that I always talk about with some of our faculty, some of my former private practice partners of, you know, we're looking at the defense, but do we need to get you help? Um, and there shouldn't be shame in doing this, you know, to restore your morale, to restore your confidence in these situations, because these lawsuits can have long lasting effects. Um, it also, you know, changes their behavior. Again, the defensive medicine um, work that I've showed you from our team, from Bob Bugena's team as well, that potentially drives up some of the costs. And so we have these, you know, really interesting policy goals where we're saying at the national level, we want to reduce imaging um, because it's the right thing to do for our patients, for costs overall. Um, but at the same time, we're basically saying, well, yeah, but if you order more imaging or, or you know, put more caveats in your reports, you may protect yourself from being um, a defendant in these cases as well. Um, and these are well above my policymaking pay grade, but these things do need to be reconciled because right now there are unintended consequences and misaligned incentives within this space. So I'll bring you back to this again, two reasons lawsuits occur, bad outcomes, unhappy patients. And so, you know, really think from the, you know, hopefully don't get too depressed from my talk, but think about sort of how to take this home into your practice down the road or today, obviously do the best you can clinically as well, but we do need to be managing expectations, communicating with patients, not necessarily us, but training our staffs to do this, making sure our referring physicians have good relationships with us and are closing the communication loop as our surrogates as well. And I think that's the best way that we can protect ourselves, but we will never make these lawsuits go away. Um, with that, um, we're, yeah, um, so I'm on time here for some questions and answers. Thank everybody for your attention. It's super early in the morning. Glad to see I kept everybody awake, either that or the cat Caffeine is really strong in the coffee here, but um, thank you all and uh, look forward to the conversation. Yeah, great question. Uh, repeat for the Zoom folks. You know, what do you think about 
um, reporting when something was missed previously. So, you know, you get into a couple situations there. I think number one, you want to make sure that you're not, you haven't found Waldo um, or were lucky in that situation. You know, was this truly, you know, a number four uh, rad peer kind of miss or was this sort of like, gee, that could have been me as well. And we've all seen those. I've seen some of those cases as well. Um, I think if you find something, you know, you you probably want to, I, I there is no right answer to this. So I'll tell you that. I think you probably want to go to sort of what your institutional risk managers want you to do based upon sort of your culture of your organization. You know, some organizations want to self-report more, some less. Um, what we did in um, my uh, former private practice, and again, with the advice of our counsel there, is, um, you know, we would obviously report that internally for peer review for us for learning opportunities, which is all protected from the courts and um, not available for discovery. Um, and we would use language along the lines of a lesion is now seen. Um, and just, just generically, it's now seen. And that way, because that, the piece there is if you're reading that second study in this situation, you won't get paid as an expert witness, but you will get called in as a witness of fact. Um, so you're working for free to say, you know, what this is and, you know, do you want to throw somebody under the bus in that situation? You may, you may not. I would argue, I, and I'm not saying sweep this under the rug. I'm saying, you know, let the experts fight this out and mitigate, you know, your own um, uh, risk and your, your organization's risk in this situation. It's like, yeah, I saw it, but, you know, he didn't see it. And I'm not sure I'm not an expert in this because they didn't allow you in as an expert in that situation. I don't know if you guys have institutional policies on that or if you've thought about that as a department. Oh, that's a part because this is a hindsight bias. Yep. Right? We know the ratios get bigger or breast yep. cancer get bigger. And it looking bad, we we'll always find something easier than prospectively looking yep. without knowing what happened six months or a year later. Yep. So there's always a hindsight bias. We don't have a specific policy, yep. but I think that that's a good point. Yep. That how do you describe how you ensure you discover it? Yep. So, Stockley? Yeah, so if uh, someone's found guilty of malpractice and an award is made, how frequently does he, how frequently does the award exceed the malpractice recovery and what happens in those instances? Yeah, great question. Um, the question is, if you are um, found negligent in these cases, and there's a ward and it exceeds your uh, med mal, um, you know, limits, you know, how often does that happen? And what are the implications there? A lot of that is going to vary a lot um, from a point of view of jurisdiction. Um, and also from a practicality perspective as well. Um, you know, if you are, I'm just trying to think some stories there. I know somebody who had a, a back in Pennsylvania, um, a $1 million cap per incident, um, which was the norm there. And it's interesting, some people will say, keep it low, keep it high, and there's no right answer in those situations. So it was what the state required. Um, and then the case was, I think, 1.5 million. But at that point, then the lawyers then need to additionally go after you as an individual for what exceeds that. Now, sometimes there's a second policy. So like in, when I was in private practice, and you probably have the same thing through University of Utah, you've got your policy, but you're also an employee of University of Utah. And there may be, you know, their vicarious liability kicks in for some of that. As a general rule, um, the trial lawyers will go for the easiest money. And if they have to go for an extra $300,000 after you personally, it becomes hard in that situation. Um, but that being said, you know, if you've gotten into, I mean, you know, we're, my wife and I are in our late fifties. And so doing our state planning, you know, we have um, been advised from a point of view there to put everything as much as possible in joint marital assets so that then they would have to sort of say, well, we're going to go after my wife who's not in healthcare at all. And that just makes it far more complicated for them in the calculus in that situation. Um, but there are people like Florida, for example, you, you don't have to have medical malpractice insurance, as I understand it. You simply need to be able to attest that you have some coverage and people go sort of bare. They put X dollars in escrow and everything else is locked up in, you know, the Caymans. Um, and so, you know, there, there are protections. So it, it's sad you have to think about that stuff, but it's probably a better question, you know, to, to talk with your institutional risk managers in, in Utah and then also as well, whoever your estate planning attorney is for protection there. 
Well, you mentioned that the one the percentage of cases or communications that find it to be confusing. How often do you make recommendations for our courts? Yeah, mo most of the time, the cases in the um, communication realm are, you know, failure to close the loop. I mean, we do a really good job in radiology of synchronous communication, the critical finding, the pneumothorax, you know, I'll call up to the OR, hey, you know, Tom, like that person, you put the central line in this morning, dropped their lung kind of thing. We're good at that. The ones that really is the, the large area of exposure is the, you know, the 1.3 centimeter ill-defined pulmonary nodule that you read on a rule out PE study at 11 o'clock at night and the internist isn't there and it falls through the cracks. And, you know, how do you loop that back and you try to get the call person. So most of the failure to communicate are sort of the, the ball getting dropped in the continuum in those situations. And I think there's a lot of opportunities for closed feedback systems. It's much easier if you're in a contained system like you are and we are, that that goes into Epic or Cerner, somebody has to acknowledge it and whatnot. Out there in the wild, which is where 75% you know, of radiology is practiced in you know, a private setting, you're in a group, they're in a different group, and you've really got to do some interesting stuff. I mean, we set up in that situation when I was in private practice, and we actually pitched it um, as a concierge service that what we basically did was we had a tracking piece there for this, that we weren't gonna pester the on-call you know, hospitalist about a subtle thing at three in the morning there. Um, we, we had an administrative person then call them the next day or call the office and close the loop and then document it on the back end um, with that system. So that's actually the reason that you, know, you really need to think about that and the, the core have increasingly um, gotten, have not been um, receptive to the, oh, I'm just a radiologist. I mean, the, Pets, the, the Supreme Court in Arizona, the Supreme Court in Virginia have both basically said, if you're a radiologist and you can't get in touch with the referring physician about something, you need to call the patient in situations. So I've actually done that a couple of times in my career. Um, and, you know, patients are pretty receptive if you um, pitch it that way. Um, with regard to recommendations, you know, that's an interesting piece. I don't have a case in here. I think I have it in the, the long four hour module of a case where I was an expert witness of a, um, uh, a teleradiologist who actually documented quite nicely in um, her report that um, you know there was pneumatosis on a, um, a CT of the abdomen and called the hospitalist at 314 in the morning. And the hospitalist basically said, thank you and did nothing and didn't call a surgeon for a consult until like six hours later. And it was just you know a shriek and peak kind of um, uh, you know exploratory laparotomy in that situation. And the deposition was fascinating because the hospitals tried to throw the radiologist under the bus and said, well, didn't, you know, did they call you? Yes. Well, what did he say? He said there was pneumatosis. Well, what did you do? Well, he didn't say I needed a surgical consult. So I said, thank you. I mean, it's sort of like, duh. Um, but that actually was a fascinating case. It was a radiologist who was, I think, one or two years out in practice and basically, you know, said we can settle out for $25,000. And that's one you should, that person should have fought. Um, but I think as a general rule, people don't necessarily expect us to get the recommendations. We're not treating physicians, but to communicate the finding, um, the dropped balls are a real area of risk. Yeah, similar cases. Not like I mostly, but I think that people are talking all this and complaining that they're getting from there. Those one of the reasons at this point. Any other gaps? Yeah, I, uh, question. So you were talking about, um, you know, the faster the radiologists are working, the mm -hmm. more errors that they'll make. And I think we're all experiencing now volumes are ever going up. And our physician workforce as radiologists is, seems to not really be matching that. Yep. A lot of people are retiring or just throwing in the towel. Our training programs have a fixed cap on how many people are, are graduating. From an ACR standpoint, is this a big issue, policy issue, and is there something being done to address that? You think? Yeah, it's it's a huge issue. Obviously, I'm not speaking individually for the college. I'm just one of 32 chancellors. Um, but it it is an area that's getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, with regard to workforce 
is now one of the big, I do receive research funding from the ACR's Neiman Health Policy Institute. And one of the biggest priorities in my research portfolio that I'm getting funded for is studying better understanding our workforce. And, you know, basically getting the data because there's still, I think, sort of the, um, the, the denialists out there that are like, oh, it'll fix itself. We always have ups and downs. And I, I think that this is very different from some of the market ups and downs we've had in the past. I mean, even just, you know, when you look at the counts of studies is one thing, but, you know, the brain CT study that I used to read on call as a general radiologist, you know, it was 12 images on a sheet of film on, you know, regular subdural and then bone windows. Now it's 2000 images. So it, it's just blowing up that's out there. Um, there's a lot of um, work in, you know, to say artificial intelligence is going to have to help us in this space. Um, you know, the ACR speaking for that, you know, was founded a data science institute and trying to find that sweet spot and actually meeting a lot with the FDA to say, you know, how can we expedite this stuff to market, but also not sacrifice patient care um, at the same time. One area that, uh, you know, if you follow Engage on ACR and it'll be a, a point of discussion at the ACR's annual meeting before our uh, council, our House of Delegates in April, is non-physician providers. You know, at what point should we be having these folks in our practices? There are some people that say, you know, this is going to take away some of our jobs. Some people would argue, and, you know, quite honestly, our practice hires, I've been, you know, employing non-physician providers um, since, you know, about 1998 in private practice. I think they really work well, particularly in the interventional space of some minor procedures and things like that as well. Um, but some people are saying, oh, they're going to take over our jobs like the CRNAs. But if the volume is expanding so much, like somebody's got to do it. And why not give off the um, low level stuff? Um, the ACR has always taken a position that, you know, radiologists are the best interpreters of imaging. Uh, obviously, that's the official position. Me individually, you know, and I'm speaking purely for myself here, says with some stuff where you say, well, do we, re if, if we only have limited resources, and I'll be talking about the diff the balance between quality and access in my grand rounds um, today at noon, but if we can't do it all, you know, should we really be fighting the turf battle with the intensivists who want to perhaps be reading the ICU chest films when they're rounding at five in the morning, rather than us giving reports four hours later for something that's not gratifying. So I think we need to step outside of our box and think about, you know, the, the sort of fiefdoms we've created. Um, no right answer or wrong answer, but um, the, you know, the, the traditional sort of let's build a moat and walls around this are, are the specialty are not going to um, uh, protect us well in the, the environment that we're moving into. Last question. So, uh, actually, a comment and then a question. First of all, outstanding talk. Thanks, Rich. The, uh, I know you visited 31 state plants and chapters of the ACR as probably got the sense of the anxiety that physicians out in private practice have about the Do you have data on lawsuits against? academic physicians versus private physicians. But my, my other my comment is that for the residents is that being sued in a lawsuit is just like the board. It causes a lot of anxiety. But uh, just like Dr. Dusak said, the question is essential. And so uh, studying uh, questions that are asked, working with your lawyer can really make the difference. I think every malpractice case I've ever looked at talks about the ACR standards and guidelines. And if you read it right on the top of every one of them, it says that these are for learning purposes only and are not intended for and should not be used to define the medical uh, standard of care in the legal setting. So, um, so do your homework. And, yep. Yeah, great, great comments, um, Rich. So I think the one key piece there is, you know, prep, 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 prep. Make sure you have a lawyer in these cases who's familiar with defending radiology cases because we are very unique in that situation. Put in a shameless plug for the uh, review article you and I wrote in um, AJR what earlier this year on sort of how to prep and think about depositions just you know if you you know and hopefully you never have to read it but know that there's stuff out there but you want a lawyer that actually will practice with you rather than say oh here's your deposition date and just leave you to the wild because there are tricks that the lawyers will use and uh, to trap you that you know we want to be honest and forthcoming as physicians and uh, you know what you say can and will be used against you except you don't have Miranda rights in a um, civil lawsuit your your question is a really 
good one about academic versus um, private practice. And we chatted about this a little bit at dinner last night. And I would love to figure out a good way to answer this. I mean, again, one of the pieces here is the challenges of using court data is that it, it's it's not really mineable. It is, it is just brute force labor reading through pages and pages of lawyer, blah, 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 to tease out key pieces here. When I give this talk in academic audiences, and say, you know, 90% of people, you know, will have been sued by the time they retire, you know, you'll, you'll get a bunch of older academic radiologists say, look, sample our room, and it's nowhere near that. I truly believe, but I don't have data, is that your likelihood of getting sued if you practice in an academic place, particularly when a prestigious academic place, is less than in a private place. And that is not a reflection of the quality of work that's out there. Um, there are some absolutely exceptional private practice radiologists. I mean, most of your trainees, most of our trainees are going to go into private practice and be people that I would want taking care of me or my family. But there's a couple pieces. Number one, it's easier to throw somebody under the bus with an expert. Oh, we've got this expert from, you know, Johns Hopkins or Mass General, you know, oh, well, where's your academic practice? Well, I practice in Boise, Idaho kind of thing. So there's, there's that sort of stigma as well. They're going to be looking about lectures and research, which you know, may have no relationship whatsoever. And then there's the other piece as well, is that if you're a famous person out there in the in academics, people will have seen your name in articles and you're like, oh yeah, I'll review the case. Oh, wait a second, that's Rich Brown. You know, he examined me on the boards, Never mind. Um, in that situation. So I think there is some protective value about practicing in an academic um, situation, but it's not full and complete immunity, uh, but I don't have data. That's purely my anecdotes. Well Yeah, great question. So for the folks in the audience is, you know, to, to, in my own snarky way, you know, with AI, you know, will you be able to sue R2-D2 um, in this, in, in these types of situations? Um, no right answer. Actually, I, I have the um, privilege of, um, there's going to be, uh, Ruth Carlos is running a uh, litigation issue of the JCR this um, uh, next year, and I'm um, guest authoring that with, or guest editing that with Jeff Robinson from uh, UW. And um, we actually have um, uh, the associate director of our Center for Ethics at Emory, a guy named John Banja, um, who actually has a review article with a few people on what does AI mean for medical malpractice. And um, having seen the manuscript, the answer is we don't know. Um, but he goes through a few different scenarios here. And I think the piece here is if AI ultimately gets into a situation where it's an autonomous De decision making tool that you know you basically say you know there's two tiers of study and this is good enough goes off to AI then probably the manufacturer will have risk in that situation in these situations but then what's the standard of care remember that definition from the um uh the the second circuit was it's you know a physician in the same specialty well is it Okay, three other AI companies would have called it or not. Um, so we're in the wild west of litigation in that situation. The other piece there is what if it winds up being much more of a decision support tool? You know, then it becomes much more challenging. And we're we're not dissimilar to when CAD came out about 20 years ago and you had the orange blobs there, and then you ignore it. Well, you know, it was there. And do you archive the orange blobs or do you not in that situation? Um, I, I really don't know the answer to that as well. But I think ultimately, if this winds up, we wind up saying, you know, stuff can be done with AI and physicians are never involved, then I think that turns these cases into much more of a product liability rather than into a medical malpractice arena. And it's no longer our problem as physicians. Now it's our problem as healthcare leaders um, as well. But I, I, I honestly don't know. And, um, you know, J John will run you through all the scenarios there because I think any one of them could happen. Yeah, great, great, great question.
Agree. That, that, that's right. I think, you know, I, I think the way this ultimately plays out is, you know, the court systems are pathetically slow, is that there will be, you know, in a few years, a convergence of these cases that go to jury trials and that people then appeal. And, you know, the way these things work is once you get a couple of discordant rulings, whether most of these will be in states, then a state Supreme Court is going to have to weigh in and say, you know, here's how we did it. And as a general rule, like the communication expectation, Arizona weighed in, I think Arizona was first, and then Virginia the year after, maybe I'm switching those, they sort of looked and said, yeah, we're going to be consistent, that makes sense. So I think this is just going to have to snake its way through the courts. But you're right, Satoshi, I mean, it's, uh, th this is going to be hyper technical, and I think is probably going to be beyond the grasp of 12 lay people, and it's probably going to get into appeals after there's a critical mass of cases. Yeah, companies all have end user license agreements that are 49 pages long, and other, when they show in the court, you check that box, I agree, that's your legal signature, so that they're going to be relieved of all their liability. Yeah, it's not yeah. Well, but although the interesting piece there is, did the patient in the ICU check that box or did the institution? I mean, I think... I, 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 I don't know. And I throw that out, not, not as much to be argumentative, just to throw that there's good, that's mud that's going to get thrown on that wall. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can't, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. Well, okay. We don't have any time left. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask you a question. Can you read a study that saying, does it really matter in the law, the wording that you use? Like, no something or no something is seen, is continuously present? I don't think it does. I mean, again, you, you know, you're asking me for 100% when, you know, you, there could be some court that says, you know, gee, you know, negative was inflamed the patient and she couldn't practice as a psychic anymore um, in those situations. But I don't think so. I mean, I think the key piece there is, did you make or not make the important finding? And if you call it no acute disease or negative or no change, and you missed, you know, a destructive whatever kind of thing, you're going to be held liable. Um, I think the piece there is, you know, back to the adverse outcomes is, you know, if you called it negative and you didn't comment on, you know, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis in the spine on a chest x-ray, nobody's going to sue you because you didn't mention DISH. Um, in that situation. So um, I, I don't think it is, but um, we do have a cultural aversion within the specialty to use the N word. And the N word I'm talking about here is normal, um, you know, that's out there. And we actually have that in a lot of our templates and uh, just to try to get people, and most people change that word, call it negative. Okay, well, let's take a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.